immediately expected some action on the part of the United States government in response uh, to that. And one of the things that we anticipated they might do is freeze Iranian assets. And we actually went down to Washington and started having some early conversations with the government, Bob Carswell and, and, and Bob Mundheim. The freeze was not only with respect to monies in the United States, but also affected deposits in other countries. But mostly it was arguments between Iran and the banks as to how much who had and how long it had been there and what kind of interest they should be paying or not paying. It was a lot of work at the beginning and a lot of work in the dark. I mean, we were really just trying to, um, to figure these things out on our own. It was like a big puzzle. The $15 billion that we ended up freezing, much the largest amount of money anybody had ever frozen anywhere, was, of course, the core of the negotiation. We were looking at uh, trying to figure out who was the government of Iran. We invented the, the big Mullah theory so that you could argue that all of the um, assets of different organizations and banks were part of one big Mullah. It was a pretty aggressive legal theory. The next thing that happened that I can rec recall was that abortive rescue mission, which really upset people. There was a lot of talk back and forth between Iran and the United States, but nothing happened. And it was only in May of 1980 that we received the first contact. I got this phone call from Germany saying that they had this meeting, nothing was going on, but the Iranian lawyers told our people we are interested, their client, which was the Iranian government, was interested in a, a quote, economic solution. Immediately reported that call to um, um, our client, to uh, Hans Anger Muller, and he and I then met with Walter Riston, who was the Citibank chairman, and told him that this had happened, and uh, what, what, should, what should we do? What are we authorized to do? He said there are two things that are going to, if we're going to pursue this, there are two conditions. One is, the U.S. government has got to be involved. We're not going to do anything without their permission. And secondly, we're not going to do some deal for Citibank alone. Hoffman was the most successful back channel I think we had. I was to make sure they understood that nothing was going to happen until they released the hostages. And those were the marching orders. And that started a, a, a pattern of meetings that went on then uh, month after month uh, as we tried to stitch this deal together. The difficulty, of course, was that the Iranians wouldn't talk to us because we were the great Satan. So you had to find an interlocutor, and that was the Algerians. It was a global project, and it involved different laws, different jurisdictions, foreign lawyers, domestic lawyers. And we put together one complicated arrangement after another, and sometimes get glimmers of hope, and, and other times it just looked bad. We had to collect all these loan agreements and go through them and make sure we understood the, how the numbers worked and analyze them, and uh, that just took a lot of time. The real difficulties, the real problems were Johns, who traveled throughout the world with these meetings and tested out the plans to see if they could sell that if he could sell it to them. But I have to say that, that there was never a moment in the entire process when I had the slightest doubt that this was going to work. I mean, I just believed it. But as time went on, events accelerated because it was becoming evident that the term of the Carter administration was ending and the new president, President Reagan, was coming on the scene. It wasn't a big period. I mean, the election was roughly the 4th of November, and uh, we had until the 19th or 20th of January to get this done. That's not much time. My job was relatively easy, was once we had the solution in hand, 
communicating it to my colleagues in the banking industry. When we, when we started to bring in the other banks, we told them what had happened and how we'd had this approach and that it had been a policy decision by our client from day one that we weren't going to do any kind of a deal that didn't protect everybody. And every bank came with its counsel and we began to work out, you know, get an agreement as to what was going to happen. I think we were about to agree on something that was then called Plan D. And this Iranian walked in, and he was look, they were looking very serious. And they said, it's no deal, and walked out. And we were working on a new plan, and Plan D, too, and this stuff. And on January 15th, I got a call from Bob Carswell and Lloyd Cutler um, at the White House, and they said they had just gotten word from Warren Christopher uh, in Algiers he, that a new proposal had been put on the table from the Iranians. Essentially, what they'd done was go back to an earlier deal, that really the basic deal that we had been working on for months, so-called Plan C. And we had to negotiate this or put this thing together with people in, in, what, four different countries in I don't know how many different time zones and three different, four different languages with lousy communications. I mean, the, the communications we were using were telephone and this, you know, telex, type telex. I mean, there wasn't any such thing as email or anything. It was awful. About three or four days out, something like that, it looked like things were going to happen. So about half the team in New York transferred to London. We wanted to have a, you know, we wanted to cut six or seven hours out of that time difference and be able to talk on a more real-time basis with Tehran, but mostly with the Algerians who were intermediating this. The way this deal worked was it had to be a series of kind of like, it was like dominoes, a series of actions where one thing triggers another, 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 another. But the thing that was supposed to start it all was a telex, long telex that we had drafted and that triggered it. It was an instruction to the banks to do this and then this and then those things all had to happen. So we're sitting there waiting for this thing. There were a number of fits and starts and I, so I can remember standing with a large group of people around this machine and you know it would be sitting there silent and cold and dark and then, and then all of a sudden you know it would light up and we would all you know reach, re lean over and try to see what was going to happen. So I get a call at London says bing you know the thing binged in London and this telex starts coming in it had a, it was a test code you know to make it authentic and then they started reading and and somebody noticed it was the wrong code so you know essentially it was it wasn't legal at some point technically you may say this is not the way it really ought to be if it were a law school exam i would say well there's this wrong and there's this wrong but ultimately you've got to make the decision we got to go with this, because if we don't go with this, we're not going with anything. It worked, which was that's all that was important. It was well coordinated by a lot of hardworking people in Algiers, London, Washington, and New York. I think at that point I was in Carswell's office, and I said, "Okay, that, I guess that's it." And it's it, okay if I call home, and he said, "Sure." So I called my wife. And I just started bawling. <laughs> I was crying. I told him, you know, we're on your way. And I was just crying. By the time I got to New York, all of the flowback had been accomplished. The money was getting spread around. The deal was over. And I had somebody take me home. And that was that. Just a day at the office, another day at the office. <laughs> it's the most successful. Uh claims program that the United States has ever had. The settlement is usually about 50 cents on the dollar. We got 100 cents on the dollar. This thing never leaked. It was remarkable. I mean, it proves the old adage, you know, you want to keep a secret. You know, you, the way you keep a secret is you don't tell anybody about it. When we got on the plane to go to Algiers, there was a picture on television of us boarding the plane, and that was the first time that my wife and family knew what I was up to. <laughs> At the time, I was dating a man who's now my husband, 
who was a reporter for the New York Daily News, who has, of course, I couldn't say anything to him about uh, the negotiations. He has, ever since then, accused me of depriving him of a Pulitzer Prize. I guess that I'm reminded of how intense it was, how seriously we took it. And because of that, how well all kinds of different people did working together to a goal that everybody understood uh, was really, really important. Years after, uh, maybe five years after, as I was testifying before some committee, bank committee in Washington, and a member of the House of Representatives who was chairing the meeting said he wanted to, for the record, to thank me. And I said, uh, well, yes, uh, or for what? He said, well, he said, my brother was a hostage in Iran, and I don't have any real doubt that you're the one who got him out. You have a lot of love for the people that you really work with that closely, and that doesn't disappear uh, with time or distance. To see the airplanes flying in, or the airplane flying into the airport, landing, and then the hostages pouring out. I mean, that was a great, great moment.